First and foremost, I'd like to thank the program for inviting me. I gladly accepted to be here not only because the subject concerns me in terms of the process behind the faces I paint, but also because it's an opportunity to present my approach and my way of functioning when constructing an individual who I'll affix to the canvas. Why paint a person, or more precisely, his face, simply because it's the most efficient, the most direct way to touch others. Everything is there. Nothing beyond the face is necessary. And thus the message has no filter but the spectator. The diffusion is immediate. The emotion reaches you directly. And you know all there is to know. And so I thought about how to approach this subject with the most precaution, humility, and respect possible. How to represent the face without distorting it without taking away its grace or its intensity. Well, we say that norms are like a code of conduct imposed upon a social group, and we call discrimination the act of separating, of distinguishing many people or things using certain criteria. I'd like to bring to your attention two kinds of norms, the first of which we can qualify as mathematical norms, and the second as artistic norms. We will begin by discussing the harmony of proportions that is the same throughout the universe and can be verified, notably, by the Fibonacci sequence, as well as by the golden ratio, and thus speaking of a mathematical norm, a mathematical norm forming the harmony of the proportions of living things, as present in animals, in humans, and in plants. And this mathematical norm, well, it is translated by numbers by digital codes, rigid and unchanging. All of this is determined by nature to fulfill aesthetic and practical needs. It is imposed on us all. By all, I mean all living things, us being an integral part. We are at the center of these mathematical combinations. We answer to these proportional norms from the first signs of our conception whether pollination in plants or fertilization in animals. And so, in opposition to this mathematical norm, we can progress to an artistic norm. The artistic norm that can be applied to painting or sculpture is flexible, cannot be translated into numbers, and is not defined by digital codes. This artistic norm was defined by men, by time periods, by countries, to tell the world who we were. For example, if we retrace history to the representation of the human in art from its beginnings to today, we could argue that in prehistory man began to represent himself alone with animal heads. In antiquity, the Egyptians and the Greeks represented themselves, respecting the norms of beauty and proportion that rendered the individual identical to others. The Romans privileged true nature over beauty creating more depth in traits and personality. Then came the Renaissance with the mastery of perspective and faces even more touching with detail pushed to the extreme. And since, this dynamic has never ceased to evolve until today. Now an artist is basically free of all norms. Practically every form of representation has been tested, and the only artistic norm to which he answers is his own. This is what makes his work easily recognizable through his personal standards and particularities. One can regard beauty and the harmony of shapes from a mathematical perspective, like the Fibonacci sequence, as I mentioned before, which is a sequence of whole numbers in which each term is the sum of the two preceding terms. Generally, it begins with the terms 0 and 1, and its first terms are 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, etc. It was discovered around 1202 by a mathematician, Leonardo Fibonacci, who described the growth of a population of rabbits in a treatise. This sequence can be considered the very first mathematical model of population growth, but we also find this sequence in nature. For example, in the positioning of flower petals, in the spiral arrangement of the seeds at the heart of sunflowers and marguerites, in the way of the scales of a pine cone or a pineapple coil, and in the spiraled shells of certain mollusks. And from this Fibonacci sequence, we can also derive the golden ratio, more or less equal to 1.6, which illustrates the beauty and harmony of shapes in animals and in humans. We attribute its discovery to the mathematician Pythagoras, around 540 BCE, and we can obtain this number by dividing, for example, the total height of the human body by the height of the belly button, and again by dividing the distance from the belly button 
to the knee by the distance from the knee to the sole of the foot. We also find the golden ratio in the human face by dividing the length of the face by its width, the length of the mouth by the width of the nose, and even the distance between the pupils and the distance between the eyebrows. You are surely familiar with the virtuous man drawn by Leonardo da Vinci, showing a man with his arms open perpendicular to his body and his feet joined inside a square, and another shape, a circle, formed with his arms slightly higher and his legs apart. This is the representation of what was called divine proportion. Da Vinci used the golden ratio for his paintings and drawings, such as the Mona Lisa. This proportion is present in the morphology of her face. As he wrote in his notebooks, mathematics determines everything. I have to observe people with attention. Why is the face handsome? Because of the divine proportions of the parts that constitute it. And each part must be in proportion with the whole. The eyes, eyebrows, nostrils, corners of the mouth, and sides of the chin. The jaws, cheeks, and ears must be squarely and straightly set upon the face. I found that the space from the middle of the lips to the top of the chin is equal to one-third of the distance from the middle of the lips to the base of the chin, and that it corresponds to one-twelfth of the face. From the top of the chin to this bottom of the chin is one-sixth of the face and one-forty-fifth of the height of a man. A good artist must show two things, the appearance of a man and the interior, the world of his thoughts. The first is easy to render, but one can only begin to communicate the second by choice of gesture, movement, and expression. The interior, the world of his thoughts, in da Vinci's words, will serve as our transition from the scientific approach to the emotional approach to representation, or more precisely to artistic norms, or should I say, my artistic norm, which I impose on myself and others. The first contact that we have with a person is visual and our brain's initial action is to search for harmony in the other. Thus, one of the first thoughts we form about that person is about aesthetic order. Sometimes, though, when we look at someone long enough, we are no longer capable of telling whether he or she is beautiful or ugly. The norm has disappeared, and we are liberated, despite ourselves, from these established notions of beauty and ugliness. Everything becomes neutral, on the same pedestal. It's called Human satiation, a term coined by photographer David Fitt in parallel with the principle of semantic satiation, which consists of repeating a word until it loses all sense. At first perceived as a whole, it is only by observation that a face shows the distinct elements that compose it, like freckles, eye color, or skin texture. The imperfections of the human face, generally masked, can be accentuated and become the basics of a new aesthetic. For David Fitt, showing faces as too human through their imperfections shatters our classic aesthetic prejudices. If imperfection can be beautiful, then how can we continue to judge that which is beautiful and that which is ugly? And to represent the human without aesthetic tricks, wouldn't that be to represent him with the pure and true beauty of his imperfections? For me, everything begins with an encounter. First, I notice a person who interests me. That is to say, a person who possesses a face that respects certain criteria of mine. An atypical face, detached, perhaps, from mathematic limits and from harmony. A young face, with fine features and an expressive look, posed on a long and fragile neck. Or I look further for the flaw that will be interesting to highlight. Her intellect, her religion, her way of expressing herself, or where she comes from is of no importance. I want only her face. These subjects may catch my attention in the street, or at a party, or simply be acquaintances. I'll ask them if they'll agree to pose for me in a photo shoot. Reactions vary with personality. Surprise, discomfort, enthusiasm. We meet at my studio. I ask them to concentrate, and I photograph them with this or that head position, with this look or that one with a certain expression. Most of the time I ask them to assume a sad look, nostalgic and thoughtful. To make things efficient, I might ask that they recall the fond childhood memories forever behind them. This is the connecting string of my work. I want to communicate a feeling of passivity, almost resignation, not only in reacting to the passage of time, 
but also the absurdity of certain human actions and of the world's mistakes. Once I think I have enough material for a future painting, I thank them and begin my selection. To begin, I look at all the photos. Then, with the three or four I've saved, I examine the details to make a definitive choice, which can come down to something as small as a lock of hair, a slight deviation of the pupil, an interesting angle, or a crease in a garment. Next, I reproduce, with the photo as my model, the contours of the face with drawing pencil on a linen canvas, and then I begin to apply acrylic paint. The result is a mixture of figurative and abstract, a balance between reality and imagination, between norm and peculiarity. The skin tone is pale, the eye black. The face may be free or shrouded by a veil of color, and the hair is almost always converged with a large quantity of white paint in order, in order to create a texture that will contrast with the rest of the hazy portrait. I create a face that is motionless, fixed to the canvas, and will always be perceived in the same way by the spectator, at least visually. In truth, I do not create a face, but modify it, distort it, to give it a new appearance, a new definition, a new identity. I spend a few days with this person, with his face, and a conversation will become established between us. While I am in some ways his creator, it is he who teaches me. It is not I who brings something to him, but he who gives it to me. Over time, I eventually created my own norm, my own approach to a face, influenced by my life, my tastes, and my wishes. Those who don't conform to what I would call my pictorial expectations are not selected, and remain on the outside of this frame of work that I imagined for myself, and are thus perceived as out of the norm by my eyes. In our society, which is more and more anchored in appearances, we tend to impose rigid beauty norms and exclude all those who don't fall within them. But I am not attracted by the traditional beauty standard. On the contrary, I need other elements to find a subject. Someone too beautiful who fits the mold would be an unusable model for me. Not raw enough, too in sync with the world's rhythm, too smooth. This could eventually help to reduce the phenomenon of discrimination, but when you think about it, it only shifts the subject because individuals who are accepted by society as respecting the standards are not accepted by my painting because they're not striking enough. As I said before, this norm that I impose on myself, I also impose on others. It exists because I must make a choice, and this choice embodies what I want to represent in others and in myself. And if there is a norm, then there is automatically discrimination and vice versa. Which brings me to think that somewhere this duality is necessary, so that one or the other can exist. Just as without evil, good could not exist. In a way, it is a part of the balance of the world. The only thing we can do is to reduce abuse of discrimination and overly rigid norms in order to limit the risks of rejection. All of these are merely my own reflections, my questioning about what we are faced with. Representing a face is a learning process. When we know one, we feel we know them all, and our instincts begin to set in. To conclude, in representing an individual face, I bring to light my personal norms of selection and enlighten the spectators on my personality. And this is why, I've come to understand over time, through my experiences and thoughts, that in representing others, in fact, we represent ourselves. Thank you.